Changing it even more is one of my favorite people, Gordon Moore, uh, at least the eponymous law that is ascribed to him. Um, uh, he likes to go salmon fishing out here in Half Moon Bay, so there's a photo I took of him. In fact, I think all the photos in here are ones I've taken, just as an aside. I love photography as a hobby. And he is a wonderful guy, and he came up with something called Moore's Law. Now, I want to ask how many people have seen Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law, which is an abstraction of Moore's Law that goes back over 100 years. Oh, come on. Are people going to try only two hands? Three? Four? Wow. This is actually one of the lowest response rates of any audience I've seen, which is, I don't understand what that means. Um, <laughs> Usually our investors, like our LPs, they don't read this kind of stuff, but anyway. Um, I think it's the most important graph of all technology business and all of history, um, of technology business. And what it's showing, just to explain, logarithmic scale, so a straight line on this would be exponential pace of growth, the slightly upticking, Kurzweil argues, is a double exponential. Where you're looking not at how many transistors are on a chip, but how many calculations per second you can buy for $1,000. Because nobody buys transistors, right? Intel may care about transistor count, and more as a co-founder of Intel certainly cared about it, but people buy computation and storage. And either way you graph it, you get this remarkable curve that transcends any one technology. So the sort of colored bands are integrated circuits, discrete components, vacuum tubes, relays, mechanical devices. The dots are the sort of price performance leaders of their day. So there may be other you know, companies that fill, or products that fill the graph below it. This is the frontier of human computational capacity. It says a lot of interesting things. First, what does that mean? You know, there are deep cosmological questions and all kinds of you know, evolutionary arguments one can make about how we use our technology to build our tools and so on and so forth. And, and, and where might this head, oh, by the way, if it goes for just another 25 or 50 years and $1,000 buys you more computational power than all human brains on Earth combined? It's kind of a, a, you reach some staggering points if this continues. It also um, begs the question of what the next technology platform would be. You know, molecular electronics or nanotech or spintronics or quantum computing beyond the integrated circuit. It doesn't have to be CMOS silicon uh, as we've known it. Something new may take over. But most importantly of all, at least from a source of optimism and, and interest, is that there seems to be absolutely no coupling to the economy. Right? So these companies may have come and gone, but the Great Depression, all the recessions, World War I, World War II, have had no meaningful impact on the trajectory of progress of innovation and technology which is astounding. You should really stop and let that sink in, because in the middle of an economic recession, you might think, oh, innovation dries up, and it doesn't, right? Within university labs, it's just booming like crazy. The companies that take advantage of that may have pent-up demand and maybe more pent-up disruption to take advantage of when you finally do come out uh, with a new product or service. But the pace of human innovation, I believe, continues unabated and is exogenous to the economy. Pretty cool. <laughs>